flew to England to take supreme command of the British and American forces, he took only one book on the plane with him the Bible. He man General Mark Clark told me that he read his Bible every day during the war and knelt down in prayer. So did Chiang Kai-shek and General Montgomery Monty of El Alamein. So did Lord Nelson at Trafalgar. So did General Washington, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and scores of other great military leaders. These he men discovered the truth of William James's statement, we and God have business with each other, and in opening ourselves to his influence, our deepest destiny is fulfilled. A lot of he men are discovering that. 72 million Americans are church members now an all-time record. As I said before, even the scientists are turning to religion. Take, for example, Dr. Alexis Carell, who wrote Man, the Unknown and won the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon any scientist, the Nobel Prize. Dr. Carell said in a Reader's Digest article, prayer is the most powerful form of energy one can generate. It is a force as real as terrestrial gravity. As a physician, I have seen men. After all other therapy had failed, lifted out of disease and melancholy by the serene effort of prayer. Prayer like radium is a source of luminous, self-generating energy. In prayer, human beings seek to augment their finite energy by addressing themselves to the infinite source of all energy. When we pray, we link ourselves with the inexhaustible motive power that spins the universe. We pray that a part of this power be apportioned to our needs. Even in asking, our human deficiencies are filled and we arise strengthened and repaired. Whenever we address God in fervent prayer, we change both soul and body for the better. It could not happen that any man or woman could pray for a single moment without some good result. Admiral Byrd knows what it means to link ourselves with the inexhaustible motive power that spins the universe. His ability to do that pulled him through the most trying ordeal of his life. He tells the story in his book alone. Asterisk, in 1934, he spent five months in a hut buried beneath the ice cap of Ross Barrier deep in the Antarctic. He was the only living creature south of latitude 78. Blizzards roared above his shack, the cold plunged down to 82 degrees below zero, he was completely surrounded by unending night. And then he found, to his horror, he was being slowly poisoned by carbon monoxide that escaped from his stove. What could he do? The nearest help was 123 miles away, and could not possibly reach him for several months. He tried to fix his stove and ventilating system, but the fumes still escaped. They often knocked him out cold. He lay on the floor completely unconscious. He couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, he became so feeble that he could hardly leave his bunk. He frequently feared he wouldn't live until morning. He was convinced he would die in that cabin, and his body would be hidden by perpetual snows. What saved his life? One day, in the depths of his despair, he reached for his diary and tried to set down his philosophy of life. The human race, he wrote, is not alone in the universe. He thought of the stars overhead, of the orderly swing of the constellations and planets, of how the everlasting sun would, in its time, returned to lighten even the wastes of the south polar regions. And then he wrote in his diary, I am not alone. This realization that he was not alone not even in a hole in the ice at the end of the earth was what saved Richard Byrd. I know it pulled me through, he says. And he goes on to add, few men in their lifetime come anywhere near exhausting the resources dwelling within them. There are deep wells of strength that are never used. Richard Byrd learned to tap those wells of strength and use those resources by turning to God. Glenn A. Arnold learned amidst the cornfields of Illinois the same lesson that Admiral Byrd learned in the polar ice cap. Mr. Arnold, an insurance broker in the Bacon Building, Chillicothe, Illinois, opened his speech on conquering worry like this eight years ago, I turned the key in the lock of my front door for what I believed was the last time in my life. I then climbed in my car and started down for the river. I was a failure, he said. One month before, my entire little world had come crashing down on my head. My electrical appliance business had gone on the rocks. In my home, my mother lay at the point of death. My wife was carrying our second child. Doctors' bills were mounting. 
We had mortgaged everything we had to start the business our car and our furniture. I had even taken out a loan on my insurance policies. Now everything was gone. I couldn't take it any longer. So I climbed into my car and started for the river determined to end the sorry mess. I drove a few miles out in the country, pulled off the road, and got out and sat on the ground and wept like a child. Then I really started to think instead of going around in frightening circles of worry, I tried to think constructively. How bad was my situation? Couldn't it be worse? Was it really hopeless? What could I do to make it better? I decided then and there to take the whole problem to the Lord and ask Him to handle it. I prayed. I prayed hard. I prayed as though my very life depended on it which, in fact, it did. Then a strange thing happened. As soon as I turned all my problems over to a power greater than myself, I immediately felt a peace of mind that I hadn't known in months. I must have sat there for half an hour, weeping and praying. Then I went home and slept like a child. The next morning, I arose with confidence. I no longer had anything to fear, for I was depending on God for guidance. That morning I walked into a local department store with my head high, and I spoke with confidence as I applied for a job as salesman in the electrical appliance department. I knew I would get a job. And I did. I made good at it until the whole appliance business collapsed due to the war. Then I began selling life insurance still under the management of my great guide. That was only five years ago. Now, all my bills are paid, I have a fine family of three bright children, own my own home, have a new car, and own $25,000 in life insurance. As I look back, I am glad now that I lost everything and became so depressed that I started for the river because that tragedy taught me to rely on God, and I now have a peace and confidence that I never dreamed were possible. Why does religious faith bring us such peace and calm and fortitude? I'll let William James answer that. He says, The turbulent billows of the fretful surface leave the deep parts of the ocean undisturbed, and to him who has a hold on vaster and more permanent realities, the hourly vicissitudes of his personal destiny seem relatively insignificant things. The really religious person is accordingly unshakable and full of equanimity, and calmly ready for any duty that the day may bring forth. If we are worried and anxious why not try God? Why not, as Immanuel Kant said, accept a belief in God because we need such a belief? Why not link ourselves now with the inexhaustible motive power that spins the universe? Even if you are not a religious person by nature or training even if you are an out and out skeptic prayer can help you much more than you believe, for it is a practical thing. What do I mean, practical? I mean that prayer fulfills these three very basic psychological needs which all people share, whether they believe in God or not. 1. Prayer helps us to put into words exactly what is troubling us. We saw in chapter 4 that it is almost impossible to deal with a problem while it remains vague and nebulous. Praying, in a way, is very much like writing our problem down on paper. If we ask help for a problem even from God we must put it into words. 2. Prayer gives us a sense of sharing our burdens, of not being alone. Few of us are so strong that we can bear our heaviest burdens, our most agonizing troubles, all by ourselves. Sometimes our worries are of so intimate a nature that we cannot discuss them even with our closest relatives or friends. Then prayer is the answer. Any psychiatrist will tell us that when we are pent up and tense, and in an agony of spirit, it is therapeutically good to tell someone our troubles. When we can't tell anyone else we can always tell God. 3. Prayer puts into force an active principle of doing. It's a first step toward action. I doubt if anyone can pray for some fulfillment, day after day, without benefiting from it in other words, without taking some steps to bring it to pass. A world-famous scientist said, prayer is the most powerful form of energy one can generate. So why not make use of it? Call it God or Allah or Spirit why quarrel with definitions as long as the mysterious powers of nature take us in hand? Why not close this book right now, go to your bedroom, shut the door, kneel down, and unburden your heart? If you have lost your religion, beseech Almighty God to renew your faith. 
Say, oh God, I can no longer fight my battles alone. I need your help, your love. Forgive me for all my mistakes. Cleanse my heart of all evil. Show me the way to peace and quiet and health, and fill me with love even for my enemies. If you don't know how to pray, repeat this beautiful and inspiring prayer written by St. Francis 700 years ago. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love, where there is injury, pardon, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood, as to understand, to be loved, as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning, that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life.